going to have. It's not necessarily we'll talk to all of them, uh, but the idea is to provide some comment in, in, in terms of the, the political situation that's going on and to use this Tanzania project that I'm currently involved in as a kind of a case study or backdrop or, or an example. Um, this slide here uh, shows, uh, was a newspaper, in, in English newspaper in Tanzania, and really points out that, uh, that there's a big problem there. Uh, I attended a, a session in GOPAC, and they pointed out that uh, probably enough money is stolen with regards to corruption uh, to feed the poor of this planet five times over when you consider that this kind of money uh, around, around the world. So if we go to the next slide, Salam, does it work? Okay. So this was what I was asked to speak on that we agreed with uh, Kimberly. Next slide. So given the first slide and the issues that, that we have in, uh, in Tanzania, uh, in my, I've, I've had about five missions there uh, already on this project, which has run over some years and about three or four to go. Um, and I've traveled all around Tanzania, and there is really no, no reason whatsoever uh, that there should be such poverty and suffering going on in this, in this particular country. Uh, you, you probably notice, it, if, if you know Tanzania, it's blessed with fresh water. It's got Lake Victoria, Tanganyika, uh, there's, no, there's no problem there. It's, it's in a sub-Saharan sub zone. Food can be grown pretty well everywhere year-round. They have a dry season, wet season, but it's, it, it's all very manageable. Uh, tourism is unbelievable there. Uh, Kilimanjaro, the Serengeti, the Zanzibar, the parks they have there. Uh, the, the Indian Ocean has fishing, uh, all the fishing resources that uh, a maritime nation could, could wish for. Vast mineral deposits, emerging oil and gas exploration. It has people, 45 million people. Uh, an education system, uh, a relative security in, in terms of uh, insurgencies. There, there's that stability is there. Uh, they have democracy, they have elections, they have a parliamentary system. Uh, aid and development arrives from every corner of the world, and yet in this country it's rated as below $570 per person per capita. And what, what is happening in this, in this particular context? Next one, someone. So just to understand Tanzania a little bit, um, on its Transparency International Corruption Index, it was uh, 116 out of roughly 150, 160 countries. It was in 2012, so it's just hovering around probably the 60th, 70th most corrupt uh, nation in, in the world. Uh, it reported that 56% of people paid bribes in various sectors, and the various sector ratings uh, that the Transparency International tends to do. But one is very good, five is very bad. The worst is the judiciary. So you've got the judiciary and the police and that kind of thing rated at 4.5, which is just almost off the clock when you, when you look at other countries and how, and how they relate there. So health is a big problem, 4.5, which means you have to pay a bribe to get, uh, to get health care, schools, political parties, etc., all the way down to 2.3 in terms of religions. And that means, this, this will tell you that in the sectors of society, in the vulnerability to bribes, probably the religions are the most trusted in, and, even, and even the military. So 93%, so now we have the readiness and willingness test here, are willing to get involved in uh, trying to make it better. So they have, to, they have come to some determination that we can't live this way anymore, and that it's starting to affect things like foreign investment, and some change has to happen. So at this point, uh, uh, I don't know if anyone saw the newspapers today with regards to um, FAD-D, uh, but they've, they've expanded their country list that's going to get aid in development by another five, five countries. So they've included um, uh, Mongolia and some other countries, but there's still a strong statement that there's a tie with regards to an economic agenda to the receipt of, of development made. Oh, come on in. Come in, come in. Welcome, welcome. Hello, Louise. Hello, that's all right. I have this very early home. Perfectly all right. So we've just been uh, talking about the environment in Tanzania and the, the issues with regards to, at least at the highest level, the perceptions of the global community and the perceptions of, of Transparency International specifically. So with all of that to be said, and yet 
uh, you know, with all of the, the wealth and the resources and, and everything that they've got there. And this TI thing, the corruption is still unbelievable. Poverty is everywhere. But there is a kind of a sense that outside of Dar es Salaam, which is the big city of about four and a half million people, it really is a country of villages. And, and I think this is probably part and, and at the heart of the problem. We're, we're imposing huge social, technological, industrial, evolutionary change in, in a country uh, without the intervening developmental steps. So how do you take a small business in, in a village or somewhere and grow it to be a big business and grow financial institutions and grow all this? In comes the big multinationals and it's very, very difficult for a, a, a country to evolve in, in a way that's going to create a very, very firm foundation for, for development. So small businesses have their problems, just, just as an example. Uh, but socially also, you're bringing in internet, you're bringing in technology that they haven't gone through uh, developmental stages to, to even to socialize. You know, the idea of, of internet, email for example. Uh, the way we would do email there is if you send somebody an email and if they get it, uh, they may not respond to it in any, in any sense because the country is more, is more attuned to you coming to talk to me and, and us talking it out and if, if we're not going to have that kind of discussion, it goes right at the bottom of the list. It might even be considered you know, imp impolite to make demands and whatnot without an exchange of views with regards to whatever you want to say, say in the email. So what we wind up doing is type up the email, print it out, put it in an envelope, block it over, you know, pass it across the table and let's have a conversation. And that seems to get you to decisions a little bit faster. So you have to under understand the whole socialization here. The next one. The fish analogy. Uh, some people may know this. We have to revisit this. This is, this is very, very serious. Um, we all know the story. You give a person a fish and you can eat a day. If you teach him to fish, he can live for whatever. He can live a lifetime. But that's not the story. The story is quit stealing the fish. You know, the whole, the whole issue of a multinational coming in and there's these vast resources that are sitting in the country, taking out these resources, you know, that properly belong to the country. And for a very, very relatively modest investment or whatever, they may take a hundred, you know, hundreds, thousand times more than they had put in. And really what they're taking out of that country is schools, education, development, all, all of these things when they take that much money out. And this, this is the, the, the paradox that, that, or the problem that we face in our current aid development kind of uh, uh, strategies there, is that we are facilitating, we are facilitating uh, uh, mines, minerals, economic uh, um, partnerships or whatever, but what are we, what are we really doing when, when we take advantage of these things? So the next slide. Our current response is, is what passes for the standard model in terms of aid and development. If anyone can tell me what the standard model is, they're a better person than I am, I will say. But it, it, is, it is something, and, and it has evolved into a donor recipient. The West are made as a result of fixed views, justice, comparative harm and neglect, and we, we deal with it that way. But other cultures look at it a little bit different. You know, they look at public good and harmony instead of, uh, of uh, comparative harm and neglect. And we have a thing where you bring in fixed views, which is what the West does, as opposed to other cultures would look, which look at sympathetic understanding. So there is that kind of, of dynamic that goes on there, and then the tension between uh, bringing in a predisposition for justice or a predisposition for the care of each other. And we, see, we certainly see that in some First Nation communities in, in Canada. Uh, we have to rethink what our engagement is going to be, the kind of relationships that we're going to have. When you build a road for your mining operations, perhaps you have, you're obligated to leave behind an indigenous road building corporation that's actually, that's actually functioning. And you have to stay there, you have to stay there in, in the long term. It, it's, it's really difficult to give a tractor a farmer and, and it's going to cost him uh, no end of money to repair it, maybe even a month's wage to put gasoline in it, and it becomes a flower pot three years three months down the road. Same with computers and technology and whatever. Without that intervening evolutionary step that some of these, these countries have not gone through, um, you, have, you have to have an obligation to, to, to stay with them longer. So we have to rethink how we actually do projects in that, in that context. Okay, the next one. So 
perhaps, you know, we look at some of the issues that have gone on in Iran and whatnot, Afghanistan. There's a three questions approach which might, which might be a little more attuned to how we introduce the relationship. Um, if we come, and even in Africa, you come there, you sit there with your counterparts and whatever, and the inevitable question will come up, how much money do you have? <coughs> You know, how much money is in, the, is, is in the picture here? And maybe the question, maybe the response should be, you know, if, if we look at what the needs are, if we try and help you do what you can for yourself, uh, what help do you need from others, the number may be essentially zero. In other words, at the end of the day, if you need 30,000 brochures to do some education or some books or whatever it is, we'll see if we can get it from you. But the money is, should not be central to the, the dynamic of the project which is often a huge problem with, the, with regards to international aid and development projects. Where's the money going? How do we spend this? How do we do this? You constantly have that administrative burden uh, going on when you do things. So people do have to take responsibility for themselves, but that also means that we have to, we have to get well into this you know, before we start in any of that. And that, that comes with the test of uh, readiness and willingness here. Next one. So the whole corruption environment, I think we, we tend to realize that if we go build strong police forces, more money into policing and judiciaries and courts and all of these kinds of things, we'll get there. But what happens if the judiciary is, is extremely corrupt? So a lot of these countries, they have all the rules and laws that you could ever ask for. No, no problem there. They've got Westminster systems, they've got courts, they've got toll words, they've got oversight, you know, they've got uh, all, all the courts and whatnot, but yet we still have a problem. And what is the problem? The problem is, in spite of living in paradise here, we're, st we're still going to mess it up because of the attitudes and the behaviors and the values that all of these people here uh, have and bring to their, you know, their, da their daily lives there. So the road to reducing corruption has to begin with behaviors. Um, we've got examples where, where countries have very, very terrible systems, very chaotic systems. But if you have a good country, if you have good people in there, you, you can make it work. Um, when I did the elections monitoring in the Ukraine, the Ukraine is attached to Poland. Both of these countries are in some ways similar. And they both had their independence at some point. And one went down a, a very, very positive road, and the other to this disaster that they find themselves. One had the oligarchs. And, criminals and everyone else uh, take over in the Ukraine and in, in Poland, it went the other way. So really, your, your, your trick or, or whatever it was that made the difference relied on the people that, that assumed government positions and assumed power and the values and the attitudes and the behaviors that they, that they held. So when the judiciary is corrupt, now what? How do we deal, how do we deal with the situation and how do we go around, around a corrupt judiciary or that we make them less corrupt? And um, I think this is the number two point I would like to make on this, in this presentation here, is, is we now have to have an approach that's going to balance all of the efforts for control and wrongdoing. Don't forget, we come from a Western society with a strong predisposition for justice and courts and laws and fixed views and comparative harm and neglect. We've got to start thinking about we can control wrongdoing in many ways. Enforcement is one way, building integrity is another, is another way. If we can if we can create a country that's, that's going to actively uh, uh, take all sorts of measures to try to increase the integrity of its leaders, you're going to get uh, less of a demand on the enforcement system. If the enforcement system is a little bit corrupt, you're going to work there. And then the third thing is to respect culture. You know, what we do here in North America and judicial systems doesn't necessarily work in villages in Tanzania or in uh, other African countries. There has to be that dynamic there. Very, very important when we look at when we look at meaning and purpose. You know, our meaning and purpose for going there may be largely economic when we look at these these countries, but uh, theirs may not. So I think uh, priority one when we're doing aid and development is uh, you've got this country here that's paradise and it still turns into a mess. Priority one is is, is good governance. And that, mean, that begins with the, the leadership. Next slide. The next ones I'll go through pretty quick. So what we were tasked to do was implement the Public Leaders Code of Ethics. 
uh, within the leadership, and the advancement of ethics in all sectors of Tanzanian society, and it's a foreign affairs project, three, four years to, to run this project. And to, to look at the leadership, we were asked to touch at least 10,000 leaders that, as a rough order of magnitude that they had identified. Uh, so we tried to, to create a vision that was going to expand the model of we're here to control corruption. No, we're going to do something a little, a little bit different or a little bit wider. And we're going to look at, say, organizations, leaders, and, and we're going to try to say rather than doing bad things, don't do bad things, how does one do good things? And what, and what does that mean? How can we support people there? So we, we would like to be ethically awake, you know, so that we understand ethical issues when they're, they're there. We have some capacity for ethical reasoning. We're going to reason somehow that's culturally uh, sensitive. And we're going to be able to act in some way. We're going to be able to act in terms of making good decisions and being able to carry them out. And if we see wrongdoing, we're going to have some, some capacity to, to look at it there. So we determined that it wasn't going to do us any good whatsoever for me to tell a leader, don't take the bribe, without looking at the meta environment and tell them don't give the, give the bribe, so to speak. So we were going to say that if, if we've got a real culture of corruption in, in, in the leadership or in the judiciary or whatever, um, one way to, to mitigate that culture is going to be look at the whole meta environment around them. You know, we're going to look at draining the swamp sort of thing that facilitates the, the corruption. So we identified a number of sectors, and we identified a different approach for each sector. So we're going to have a, a strong uh, training you know, uh, effort that goes on the leader, but we're also going to have pilot projects that go out into business, uh, into academia. Every leader comes through the schools, the elementary schools, and the universities, and how can they uh, participate in this? Civil society, <coughs> you, vote <for> good <coughs> you vote for good people, you might get good governments. So uh, attuned to that, the public service, they see the corruption, how can they in some way um, uh, report it safely, in some way that's reprisal free, which is a big huge issue, and then how can this support be supported through the secretariat or whatever that can, uh, that can manage accountability at some, at some levels. So we, d we decided to go beyond traditional leadership expectations. When anyone here goes to an MBA course or whatever and you sit down there and they give you ethics and you've got to take this course, so you sit through it and they tell you how to behave. They tell you, you know, no insider trading, this, that, and whatever, but it's, a, it's an eye-oriented sort of context with regards to ethics. What, what lacks in this organization is how, can, how should you actively build an ethical organization? In other words, how do I behave? Yes, that's one thing, but how do I make my organization ethical uh, for people that are going to run these things and, and develop the ethics of public servants or people underneath you? Or, or, or. So these were the two dynamics that we were going to uh, we were going to look at with regards to leaders. So we we created an ethics program. We don't have to go through this, but it talked about okay. We, we can solve the whole problem if we can do one thing and we get good ethical decision making once sort of leaders. So we're going to promote that and we're going to do training and rewards and advisory and mediation capacities and accountability, the, the standard things, reprisal free, um, understanding that, you know, that ethical behavior has, con uh, ethical misbehavior has consequences. So some sort of program that's going to, to look at it from this, this dimension. Uh, we were required under the project to produce a leader's guidance. So this is just kind of a, a, an index of the thing. You know, what do we expect from you? How do you make decisions? How do you build the ethics climate dialogue? How do you do a new public servants ethics orientation? A new employee comes in. What do I, what do I say to that person as, as a leader? Uh, performance evaluations. What are ethical relationships? Uh, what does gender sensitivity mean? Because uh, gender is a huge component in this project. And then outreach to the business sector and society. So there's that meta environment that we talked about in the previous slide there. What does that mean for a leader when he, inter he interacts in that, uh, that domain? And then on the control and wrongdoing side, this was the building integrity side, okay, how do we make complaints? How do we handle them? How do we do risk management, reprisal protection, closure, nonviolent communication, conflict of interest, which is, which is huge transparency and 
you know, from the various measurement and the things that they have to do. So in the whole context of this, when we approach anybody, it has to be from a positive, constructive dimension. Oops, sorry. Why are we doing this? We're, tr we're trying not to say that we, corruption is such a big problem and you're all bad people. We're trying to say, you know, we think people basically can be uneth are unethical people, are, are uh, ethical. So we don't do this because we think you're unethical or to catch or punish people. We do this to help good people do the right thing. So this is a supportive sort of structure to help people make ethical, reprisal-free uh, decisions and conduct. Because we know if you have an unhealthy climate, people just don't speak up. And that's the whole problem. Nobody speaks up in those countries because of the power that people have over jobs and relationships and things like this. So uh, we grounded it somewhere. Uh, we were looking for something positive rather than the, OE, than the UN Convention Against Corruption, uh, the OECD principles for building ethics in, in an organization. These are fairly standards, should be free, you know, guidance available, commitment decision-making <coughs> process, guidelines, everything that we are incorporating in, in the various guidance documents we have. And then pictorially, we were trying to say, okay, what does success look like in a sense? What does an organization look like? Well, you win if, if you can get the ethical decision-making right. You know, the, the organization will do the code and guidance stuff. The leaders will have their expectations to behave and build ethical organizations. Some orientation when you come in, uh, some way that you can exercise voice and disclosure when you see wrongdoing, a secretary that will help you, some training, some dialogue, and how do we interact with the meta environment and the community around us. All right. So well, the vision is really simple. Uh, the whole, for the whole program, it's about ethical decision making, control and corruption, building integrity, and, and ultimately social responsibility. The next ones we can go through pretty quick. Uh, well, what we expect of organizations, of leaders, behave, build ethical organizations, manage your relationships in a positive way, and, and, manage, and manage the risk. Okay. And we put 3,000 years of moral philosophy in one slide here. So we have to try to get this down to the system to the level where um, the language is appropriate. Um, we use the analogy of the car uh, with regards to language. In other words, uh, if you're going to build a car, you've got the physics uh, uh, behind uh, internal combustion engines, and that operates in academia, and that's fine. We'll speak that language. Then at the level of the government secretariat, that's the engineering part, and they'll design programs and whatever. But when we're talking to people who are driving the car, that's another very simple language. So we leave out Immanuel Kant and then Socrates and Aristotle and all these things and try to capture what would be the best payback, you know? This is what values are, this is what ethics is, the, the, the doing the right thing, and this is what a good person should be as a, as a habit of living. That's the, basically the Socratic model. Okay. So now we have to talk about values and risks. Okay, if we're gonna, if we're gonna define values uh, as, as the beliefs that we choose, we selected a model that looks like an onion and it's very, very simple and easy to communicate. In other words, what's the I value when I'm sitting at work? I'm going to be honest. When I'm dealing with others, I, I treat Kimberly with respect, you know. Uh, the institution demands that I be punctual and responsible and competent. And clients and suppliers that we obey the laws, contractual compliance, avoid conflict of interest. And society wants us to be socially responsible. We give honest government, we give we look after the environment, financial responsibility, and social beneficence. In other words, we, we benefit society in some way. So you can, you can create an entire value framework, you know, with five values, and the corresponding risks uh, just pop out at you. What does disrespect mean? It could be harassment or something like this. So the decision-making model, there's a big model behind this, big conversation, but basically we we're trying to get them to go beyond uh, what do rules and laws say, to consider the consequences, and maximizing the good consequences, uh, the care of others, and the values. In other words, decision-making is a little more complicated than, than just somebody giving you the answer. 
and a lot of these questions have competing values in and are tricky. So all the case studies usually have no solution, uh, no right right solution. There's, there's many solutions to it. Okay. Uh, so really quick, this is our accountability framework that we came up with after some conversation. At the employee level, you know, duties and responsibilities in accordance with highest ethical standards. We don't condone don't condone wrongdoing. We speak up. We manage relationships in a certain way. The leaders do the awareness for their people, risk management, opportunities for dialogue. And at the executive level, we include ethics in policy and decision making, programs and accounts. So it's a real simple model that, that, you, can, uh, that you can create. Uh, and these are just examples now. This is the ethical climate model. Uh, language, space, and bias. And when you go into an organization and you can see if they're using the word ethics, if that word is even in the vocabulary. Have you heard anyone use the word ethics in the last year? Anyone who raised issues, whatever. When they're raised, is there some space taken to discuss these things? And they do, do they have a preference for doing the right thing? Okay. It was sufficient that I was able to do what I, what I could do today. So, which gives us some sort of, I made a difference. That's it. Okay, so five minutes over. Uh, if there's any discussion, and this was really a real quick, uh, you know, look at some examples and, and, and maybe a high level view at, at how we can do it. Any questions? I, I like the focused on uh, how can good people do good things as opposed to the punish. Well, don't do bad eliminate. things, how yeah. can we do good things? What I, I was surprised, that I didn't see a discussion of, of incentives. Why should I be a good person to do, doing good things? It, maybe it's kind of masked it inside the, the description, but not in a sort of explicit yeah. push in that, in that direction. No, and, that, and that's, that's important. One can do good things for two reasons. Because it's the right thing to do, mm or I'm going to do rewards and punishment. We all understand right. the Kohlberg model as to why we will respond to things. I want to belong to the group. Mm. It's a principle justification of rewards and punishment. Right. And if you saw the third line in the mm. program there, mm. we were looking at trying to inject good ethical behavior, building ethical organizations or whatever, into their career management system. Uh -huh. In other words, your, your evaluation. So there's going to be some reward and punishment at, a, at, a, at, a, at that level, at a career level. But that's not necessarily the right reason one should be doing a good thing. No. You know, one should be doing a good thing because it's, it's the right thing to do. But okay. this, this is the road that we're on. Not, not all people are at Kohlberg's highest level of moral development here. Indeed. Um, I noticed also is that the commissioner you were speaking with said that you changed our minds around, which was huge, I think, I'm yeah, sure. So you made up my brains, our brains changed. Did, did you see, or are you seeing a heart talk understanding of it also? Oh, definitely. I think this culture resonates more to a heart level conversation than a mind level, a technical mm. level conversation. Okay. Yeah, no, 100 percent. But having the conversation and translating that into behaviors now is going to be the, the challenge. Yes, yes. <coughs> When, when presenting the, this model to uh, different people, especially in uh, African country, I think the one point on which they will, with me, they don't really agree, uh, they don't see the necessities, the ethical secretary, mm -hmm. uh, the building oh, okay. of the ethical secretary, again. I can say three, three different people say it. We don't see it as uh, something we always we, we have our court justice. We have different uh, institutions that we don't need in ethics. How can we go over I, we, we have encountered that also because when, once the government is seen as corrupt, it's kind of whitewashed that way. Everyone is corrupt. If there's an ethics organization there, how can that not be, not be corrupt? And uh, what we tried to do was to take away the engagement from the ethics secretary and put it into the domain of the leader. So the leader ha now has to do something. So he would be, in a sense, the ethics secretariat in his, in his organization. 
people can come to him. He has to make the organization ethical. He has to behave. Uh, but we did notice that in all the departments, the MDAs as they call them, uh, ministries, departments, and agencies, have their own integrity committees. So they, the structure is all there. And that why are you why are you 116 on the corruption index kind of, kind of thing? And uh, you, you're right. The, the, tr the mistrust of the central authority is, I mean, it's even, they have just given up on it in, in a lot of cases. It's like the Ukraine. I mean, I think any region in the Ukraine that could have voted to separate from the central authority would have gone. Because they got no support and there was just so much corruption up there. But that's, yeah, you're right, that's a big challenge. And they're seen as a threat right now, as, rather than as somebody who helps you. And uh, we're going to have to change that. And yes, Hi, coming back to this incentives question, um, I, I found there wasn't, perhaps I missed part of it, um, there wasn't much focus on this, and I found personally that tends to have the largest impact. There, There's one great story of a company that was being quite active in China on construction, and they came in and they were doing these ethics classes and, and nothing was catching on, and they, they clearly weren't communicating it properly, and what ended up working the most effectively was, you want to be a world-class company? Well, guess what? This is what world-class companies do. And they all go, yeah, of course we want to be world-class. Absolutely, we want to be the best. Well, this is what the best companies do. They go, oh, OK, fine. And then listen to the rest of the course and implemented it. So there's, there's a lot of how do we get people to see this as their incentive. And I didn't see much focus on well, that. What I didn't put up there was the slides that talked about readiness okay. and wellness. So uh, this conversation has to be had. And, mm -hmm. and you're right. Uh, World class is, is one of the things. When we talk about why I want to do this, there's a list of probably 20 or 30 that you can put in there. And economic success is obviously one of them. Quality of life is another one. And uh, you know, issues of power, corruption, all of these kind of significant emotional events. You know? uh, military that had a Somalia crisis all of a sudden has a great incentive <coughs> to make a change. So there's, there's a kind of a, an interview-focused dynamic that goes on there in the readiness and willingness component. Otherwise, you're absolutely right. Uh, uh, nothing will happen. But uh, you can, I'm going to try to go back to the program, you, you, you can design it in. Uh, if you can go. Am I making a mistake here? Yeah, oh, yeah, Kimberly's after me. So. The microphone. Yeah. so on the ethics program, for. You're right. People who set positive examples and things like this have to be rewarded in some in some way. But your comment is that has to also apply to the whole organization. You know that that applies to a strictly individual behavioral uh, reason for doing something. Well, why would the organization as a whole want to adopt social responsibility and uh, you know fund hockey teams or, or or whatever that they might they might do? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Please. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for this presentation. I think it's uh, it's high level and it provides a, a very good uh, a very good uh, framework for you know how to approach this. And I guess it can be applied to any kinds of values as well as things being at the core. I think of, of the for sure. of, of, of values based organizations, and I think it's more and more important now nowadays. And uh, I liked your 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 context. And I was disappointed with it because I haven't been active in the field in terms of donor Recipient coordination stuff. and aid effectiveness since 2005. So it seems that it hasn't moved black hole for me at, at all since 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 then, and that is disappointing. And and I think your conclusion as, as well brings us back to to that to that context in terms of how differently we have to do things nowadays and. And first, starting with with the donors, even eh? ourselves, and, uh, and I fully agree, you know, with with your uh, the way you, you you present this, and it can be done. It's not that complicated. And then my 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 I guess my other comments were also were touched about the incentives, and that's a question I've always asked mm -hmm. myself and asked other people before too. And there is those strong ins and people, and I've always asked myself, well, why do everybody, they keep talking in the country, they keep talking about it, they know their leaders are corrupt, they know everybody's corrupt, but it goes on and on. I mean, it, it, they don't do anything to stop it. And that was always my question. 
and 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 actually it's because many people benefit from it. It's almost the the, the it's almost the, the social uh, the the yes system, you know, the <coughs> benefit system actually. But it's a very wrong one. <laughs> but it 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 and, and that I think is would be the most difficult thing to 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 attack. And now in my my discourse nowadays, what I I started saying, it's also very simple, I said, you know, instead of competing so that you can, sh you know, share among yourselves the piece of the pie, you have to work together e effectively and with transparency to create a bigger pie for everybody. <laughs> I agree. Totally, so, totally, so, totally agree. so, but it takes, I think that is the most difficult thing in terms of creating that positive incentive to, 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 to fight corruption. Yeah. And it, and it starts with the attitudes, values, and beliefs. Absolutely, and absolutely. And so as part of this, we are not going, oops, sorry. Yeah, I'm stand here, stand over here. We are not going to not go to the public schools. So it's going to start with children, and it's going to be a directional thing, and it's, it's going to be generational in a, in a sort of a context. And we've uh, looked at a process that's going on in Haiti, uh, in which doing the right thing and these little little things that they can inject uh, ethics at the lowest level, you know. Right. Here's a picture of somebody hitting somebody. Here's a picture of you noticing it. Here's a blank picture. What would you do? Sort of thing. Draw in what, what you would do. If, and, and they get that, and they'll get that sense. Yeah. You know, and then hopefully vote for honest people and you get, you know, you got to work your way all the way up. But to, uh, yes, thank you for your comments. We have a question from, uh, from the sure. webinar. Sure, read it. Uh, Chris, would you like to go ahead? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, yes very clearly. Okay, good. Nice all. Uh, thanks for that. I, uh, I agree with you that uh, what you've done, what you've uh, outlined, is, is going to uh, be effective, but it will take about a generation to do so. And I uh, haven't, haven't been to Tanzania, but I come from one of the most corrupt uh, countries in the world, and that is Yemen. And I have found that uh, even with uh, increasing levels of education, what happens is actually that uh, corruption gets worse and worse with the offensive uh, not better. And so uh, there is some uh, that uh, and if I follow this uh, theory to a certain extent, although I'm not uh, talking about concentrating on uh, teaching ethics rather than university degrees, I understand that. So I think there has to be uh, something more than that to, if you want a uh, rapid result. And the most important is the rule of law. And if there is no uh, way of ensuring that there is uh, a decent, uh, non corruptible uh, judiciary, uh, none of uh, this will ever happen. And just uh, the other comment is, uh, that you could respond to is how have the Chinese dealt with this situation in any different and better way? Because as you know, they are making real immigrants into Africa, and my, my reading on the subject is that uh, where they are, the uh, level of success and uh, uh, the uh, relation of uh, uh, at least the amount of corruption is <coughs> somewhat less uh, and they are more successful. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Case, Dr. Gunn. Uh, I would agree in some things. Uh, of course, increasing e e uh, education may well give you the power to be more corrupt in a sense. I mean, with lower levels of education, you may be dealing with lower levels of money. Uh, with higher levels of education, you may become a bank manager or a hedge fund manager, and therefore, uh, what we're talking about is is the capacity and the power that you have to uh, uh, to do things that are wrong. Um, there is part of this that we talk about uh, what's what's changing in, in our in our society here that we didn't have 20 years ago, and uh, what's happening is wrongdoing now can leverage power and technology in ways that uh, you ne you never were able to. I mean, the lowest level employee can uh, put something on the internet that can be on the world stage by supper time, you know, and, and can do almost irreparable damage to, uh, 
Look at, look at Manning and Snowden and some of these things. Tremendous amount of damage that somebody at a very, very low level can do. So the question that you've got to ask yourself is you are now leading people who are not only empowered, but have massive amounts of power because they control uh, computers, internets, and whatever. And then the question is, how does, does a leader manage these uh, people, or how does a society look at people now who have all this, all this power? And the question has, has to sort of lead itself into the area, well, people that are going to have this power have to make better ethical decisions. So now we've got to look at whatever the education system that's going to give them the uh, uh, the leverage to, to have this power, but also to give them the context in which they can make decisions with this power. So there's the power over, power above, power with sort of, sort of paradigm that you can talk your way through. And what we have done as part of what I tried to say here is rather than just go to the control and corruption model, we've got to go to the building integrity uh, aspect also because that would feed into the domain that you're talking about. And Casey, yeah, I certainly appreciate uh, the Yemen context and, and the whole issues of security and everything that, that and the rule of law that have to uh, uh, that have to be in place. Um, we had one more uh, question from Barry on the webinar. Uh, yeah, Barry, do you want to go ahead? Uh, this, this yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Very clearly. Okay. Good. Uh, I'm Barry Pinskin through Stops uh, Canada. Uh, we work with an organization in Dar es Salaam that uh, confronts these issues pretty much every day, uh, in part because they help very low income people buy land and build housing. So there's, there's many stages in that process. I mean, every stage in the process, there's a hand of it. That's correct. Uh, so I'm, I'm wondering, did, did you do, I have two questions. This is one. Did you, did you do any work with uh, local authorities? And how can uh, our partner hook into the program that you're involved with? That's my first point. Uh, the second, I think we all have a responsibility, particularly with regard to Canadian multinationals, so to monitor their behavior uh, in the countries where we're working. Uh, it's very hard for me to imagine, probably because I've worked in Tanzania too well, and, uh, a Canadian uh, mining company operating without having bribed somebody along the way. Correct. It's almost unimaginable. Um, but we, to my knowledge, we haven't ever prosecuted any of those companies, even though we can. Um, what's your view on that one? Well, my view on this one is, uh, yes, we can collaborate. We are at the point of the project now where, where we are now looking at a pilot project in each of the various sectors that we're talking about. And uh, certainly the, okay. the business sector is one of them. And if, if you would like to connect in there and uh, uh, have the conversation that we're going to have with regards to, we were hoping to go to the mining sector, uh, go to one of their associations and try to develop an accord there. And the accord was basically going to say, if you want to have a good relationship with government, what does that mean? If government wants a good relationship to you, what does that mean? And then there's the whole issue of bribes. I mean, sometimes, I'm asked for bribes just to get into my place of work, you know, they, they change the security guard or whatever and, and, and he's, he's not letting me in unless I, I pay him some money sort of thing. And when you deal with corruption, you're dealing with, of course, the petty, the petty bribes at the bottom, the systemic stuff in the middle and then the state capture at the top. It's the big huge bribes in the middle that we're trying to basically get at because we realize that you know, a civil servant in Tanzania gets $80 a month and it doesn't, it, it's, it's hardly able to sustain them. And uh, so the question is, in order to, to put these things aside until issues of, of uh, poverty and employment and wages uh, catch up to the, uh, uh, you know, catch up to their ability to live, and therefore they wouldn't have a necessarily a reason to, to ask for these bribes all the time. I mean, we institutionalize bribes here in Canada. It's called the tip. You know, it goes in your bill there and goes in somebody's income tax or whatever. Well, that over there, it's, it's similar. And I don't think we should get all that upset at those lower levels until they solve some other problems of poverty, health, and education. Now, in the area that you're in, uh, the challenge is, is a little more difficult. I've seen some uh, uh, approaches. One in India, they had a zero rupee note. 
And the idea being is when someone asked when you were bribed, you would pay it with this zero <laughs> rupee note. But on it, it had a kind of a context in which is designed to shame the person asking for, for a bribe, the policeman or, or whatever it was. Now, th that may be something at the, at the lower backsheesh level, uh, but at your level, we have to have this, this conversation. And uh, for sure, as we, as we go through this program, hopefully we can help. But if you do want to, uh, to get in touch with us, uh, uh, this is too easy. And one last question. Okay, we'll do that. No. Okay, did you have another question in there? Uh, Chris, do you want to go ahead? Chris? Yes. Yeah. Right. Uh, Paul. Case. Case. He, he, yeah, he's not uh, answer the question about the ch how the Chinese deal with... Oh, the Chinese, okay. Also, but I, I, I do have a, a comment for you. I have a Chinese answer. Come from, I'm sorry? I, I'll answer the Chinese one. I forgot about it. Yeah, uh, but I have actually an experience that you may not be aware of. Uh, as you know, uh, Yemen was made up of uh, South Yemen and North Yemen at one time. Correct, yeah. Right? And I come from the South. And uh, at one point, uh, South Yemen was uh, governed by a communist regime. And in spite of all the horrors of the communist regime, they had one uh, thing uh, that they did differently. And that is, people who were convicted after a you know, paper trial and so on, of uh, uh, corruption of a certain size, were actually executed. 1,300 last year. I'm not going to say this is draconian, but what happened was the difference in the level of corruption between South Yemen, which was a country of its own, and North Yemen was absolutely enormous. I mean, corruption was really uh, virtually eliminated in the South. Of course, uh, I mean, the communists committed lots of other crimes, but when it comes to corruption, that's what happened. And in this is something you probably never read about. Well, I, I am quite aware of the Chinese approach to corruption back in China. I think mm -hmm. over the last decades or so, some number like either 1,300 or 13,000 have been executed uh, for various uh, corruption offenses. The question is, is that, you know, does that resonate with our value set? Is that, is that a kind of a place that, uh, that we want to go? Uh, for sure, you can solve you can solve corruption if you, uh, if you execute everyone who, who creates corruption. Uh, but I don't think that that's, that that's uh, for us. Now, when I see the Chinese operating in Africa and, and how they get around these things, I, I don't think they bring their values into, into the equation. If, if there's a bribe to be paid, they'll pay, they'll pay the bribe. Uh, if, they need, if they've got a mine and they, and they need to deliver the, mine, the mineral somewhere, they will build the road. But it'll be basically built by uh, Chinese people, and that there will be no moral judgment on their on their part as to the environment or the conditions of the environment that they're that they're operating in. Um, we live in a society that just has a different value set. And then at the end of the day, you know, how much price do we put on money uh, with regards to uh, uh, to the response to to that? You know, I, I think the the domain of um, human suffering and poverty and education, these kinds of things, are uh, have significant weight in how in how we do things, as opposed to going into a country, taking whatever resources you can out of the country as quick as you can, and in effect impoverishing the country in in in, in some regards as China would do. So from China's perspective, okay, but from Tanzania's perspective, not good, uh, and we have we have to look at that. Thank you, Case. Right, and um, going back to your comment, fish analogy. The fish, yes. Stop stealing the fish. That's right. Can you actually offer a solution? For example, Paul Collier in the bottom billion is actually suggesting that we put the, the natural resources up uh, auction. We auction them mm -hmm. in order to sort of increase transparency mm -hmm. and allow those countries to get a, a, a fair price for right. their natural resources. Right. Being in the field, can you actually offer a solution? What well, do you see? We have seen examples of how people deal with the fish. I mean, you, go, you can go back decades and look at Saudi Arabia when the Seven Sisters in there were pumping oil out like there was no tomorrow, and then they decide just to nationalize. They said, you know, that's it. You're not, you're not stealing. And some of these companies, 
uh, I think I've been told nationalization is one way. Um, there isn't a good paper on Kimberly's website there that I, that I read the other day that talks all about this corruption. It's one down the, the left-hand side there. Another way is to bring these companies in and say, your current royalty for this, whatever it is, is 5%. 5, 10, 15% is, is, is a kind of a number that, that seems to happen there. You should just look them dead in the eye and say it's 55%. And if you want to leave, leave. We'll find somebody who's a little more uh, amenable to, to paying a decent royalty and we get a fair exchange on this. The other way is, uh, and, and a couple of years ago when I was dealing with First Nations there, there was one First Nations company taking a company to court for $126 million worth of minerals that they had taken out of the uh, First Nations land. They had gotten some mineral rights or whatever it was and, and we're suing them for the fair share of that. And um, you saw what happened yesterday with regards to land rights. You know, I'll bet you you're going to see a bunch, bunch more of those in, in, in quick time and uh, see what happens. So the playing field, well, they get, they, get, they get smarter and smarter at this. Venezuela, for example, decided to nationalize it, its soil at one person. It just looked at the money that was flowing out, that was hospitals, roads, development, education. We may not have liked it. The, the oil companies may not have liked it, but I didn't have any problem with that. Not, not a bit. Anyone else? Okay. Um, you were just mentioning different value sets, and that relates to the question I was going to ask, because I'm wondering how you... I mean, I agree with all what you've said, but in a society where, for example, uh, it's built on patronage, so an ethical person, a virtuous person, a good person doing the right thing, a leader will share his his access to resources that he has through power with his community. And that's, that's right. you know, seen to be a good thing. And if you don't do that, you know, you're not going to be a leader very long because you're, you're not behaving appropriately. So, uh, you know, and that's very prevalent, you know, in the, in the area where you're working. So how do you sort of reconcile? Well, you're right. The good person in the corrupt organization. You know, there, that, there is that dilemma. Uh, the other reconciliation has to be at the point where you've got to get people to ask the question when the candidate comes around. What would you do about corruption, your values or whatever? And then if you don't own up to it, you throw them out the next time. But at some point, uh, they, they start to get there. And then, and then you look at the countries that have had a good start. You know, the Julius Nereris, these guys are really, really good people that come in and put the, put the country on a good road. You get a bad person come in, and you know, away, away it goes on one side. So the leaders who are going to say to themselves, you know, that I'm going to, to be a good leader and kind of thing, will influence their organization, probably their own organization. But the little model it's used is a little bit of a pendulum. There's a pendulum there, and it says that if a country is, if, if a person, organization, or whatever is morally neutral, just comes to work every day, follows the crowd, doesn't make a lot of decisions, a good person comes in, good things happen. Bad person comes in, bad things happen. But if the organization has a bias towards doing good things, a bad person comes in and it will resist and push back um, a little bit. But you don't want to be that morally neutral thing. So that's the awareness that has to go on there, even if it's just asking the question of yourself. And then how can I respond each day? I, I think there's a, a certain danger in I see in your approach. At the beginning, I, I see sort of well, we gave you the Westminster system with the judiciary, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, but you didn't really follow that. It's a mess. And, and, so, and so we were, you know, I guess we'll have to find some other way of, so you can better pursue our system. And, and to follow up, what you're, you're saying is, what I'm, see, what I'm hearing from you is sort of similar to what I hear, you know, hear about why they had to get rid of the potlatch system, right? Because it was a personal thing that the chief had to show his people uh, that uh, that they were generous, that there was an exchange taking right. place. And, and so then it comes back to the, you know, is the African system essentially corrupt or is it because this is the way that the African system works and how you have that conversation with what you're trying yeah, to achieve. I, and, I, and I would say it's not a s essentially corrupt. Mm. You get a good leader in there, like even Kikwegi, mm -hmm. the current president of, of Tanzania, he wants to do things different, you know. This is the whole reason we've got this money and this, this project in there. He says, we, we've just got to change here. It's starting to affect foreign investment. 
And but you do need you do need leaders at some point. Otherwise, if you're if you're below a leader, as we said, in an unhealthy ethical climate, the default is moral silence. You know, the people will just not do anything. They'll just won't say anything, and everything will be will be propagated. So then the question is, how do we help the good people? And then everything tumbles from there. Yeah, Maya. Yeah, and I guess following on on that, my. A reflection after this is that you kind of downplay the uh, focus on, on leaders and I think to enable people to who are capable already to make moral decisions and they might be sitting silent and support them, yeah. and, support them and to create within the system a process that will identify people who are already capable of doing that instead of training somebody artificially mm -hmm. and, and bring them, them up yeah. to the position of leadership because they already have this capacity. Mm -hmm. Because usually in that society, you know, somebody who has more guns is going to be a leader. That's right. So, and, uh, and, and this, they are going to be as a role models at the same time. But this, in a sense, this has to be embedded within the city. Training investigators and lawyers and tribunals and all of the, these kinds of things. So we're trying to, my view is I'm just trying to balance it, but I am trying to put the leader right in the center of that little circle there, of that whole meta environment, and he's going to get some 2,000 psi attention for sure. But mm -hmm. it's it's bigger. And I agree. It, it's, it's well, it is right here. You know, yeah. the judiciary is the same. It is it's one thing. Yeah. But let's say the political system, like you said, that most of the leadership comes through pol politics. Yeah. You know, we don't have that here. Yeah. You know, unfortunately. But uh, you know, if, the, if having and there is a lot of leaders, and you know, on the on the level of, of tribes and, and villages, mm -hmm. that people, everybody can identify who is the moral leader there. Yeah. And if there is a system that is enables to yeah. kind of empower them. Identify. And identify and empower them and teach them about the rights and their responsibilities. T totally agree. Both. Yeah, totally agree. Because they already have basics. I go to a little village yeah. and, and whatever numbers are very relevant here and I ask, how many leaders do you have here? We got 1,200. How many are public servants? 400. Yeah, that means the rest yeah. are politically elected, you know, yeah. in, the, in the area there to hold all, to hold all of these out. So these are political leaders. Yeah. Very, very different culture. In the, in the same sense, do you think we will have to um, go to the religious leaders? We do. Okay. Yeah. And I'm actually saying this because it, when I look at the, 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 the story of the Grameen Bank in Bangladesh, the, 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 the religious sphere had to be included in order for that bank to... Mm -hmm. Like we, we have ethical dilemmas, gifts, benefits, and hospitality, accepting gifts. Well, they have a reverse problem. When any public official goes and visits a tribal leader or a village leader, or he has to give a gift. You know, the gift giving has to go in reverse. If, if you want this, the village to come aboard with this government program or whatever you're, whatever you're doing. So you have to bribe people to conform to government programs. So, you know, and then what does that mean? Well, you're allowed a 55,000 shilling gift. And, uh, it translates into chickens and stuff like this, but it's, it's still there. Mm -hmm. It's kind of, kind of amusing. How did you uh, deal with the interpretation of the word risk management for leaders? <laughs> um, because as I've seen it in the Federal Public Service, risk management is, this is a way that we don't have to do anything. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. yeah. How did you...? We're, we're trying to tell public leaders that, A, they have to know what the risks are, mm. uh, and they have to know how they're going to respond to them. But B, they have to communicate that to everyone in the organization. So if I ask you what are the risks around here, you'd say something. You'd say the same thing. And if I said, what are you going to do about it? There's some. So there's the awareness component and the, uh, uh, the feedback component. Thank you very much. Thanks. So Okay, I think we're, no. we're about half past. Yeah, we're hitting the end right now. So.
Does anyone have any more? One last I just, one Yeah, I just have one question, and, and my interest is, is, is in businesses going into these countries, Tanzania and other African countries. Um, and I actually have two clients that are going to be going in with uh, a hydrokinetic water product. And I guess the issue is, is that, I mean, they're already in Micronesia, and they recognize that they one has to pay bribes, and one, mm -hmm. there is this level of corruption. Is there anything that, I guess that's just, it's a way of doing business, right? You, one at this point until these kinds of... Um, well, it's a way of doing business in two ways. I mean, the Americans now have the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, and the Canadians have the act that prevents bribery of public officials. So if you're paying a bribe to a public official in, in, in any of these countries here, you are liable for prison terms. I mean, this is, this is a big, yeah, big, I, big... So you're making a decision there. And globally, everybody is, is wrestling with this problem. I know. You know, sort of thing. Because the Germans even have, on their income statement, they have a line yeah. that's, that's right there. Right, it's, it's an expense line, right? It's a well, line item. You, you can call it facilitation payments, you know, right. consulting. Right. There's all sorts of words that, that go around this. Right. But the bottom line is it, it takes one point some trillion dollars out of the, out of the economies of all these, these, these countries when you, when you pay this. So um, you, have to make, you have to make a moral decision on, on, you, on your social responsibility policy in your company, in these companies. And uh, you either pay the bribes or you don't. Uh, I would not say, if, if you're going to say, well, we have to pay the bribes to get the business, then you're saying the cost of business is, is to uh, uh, be in a criminal sense, you know, that, that we are going to go there rather than go, than go somewhere else. But it's, it's the thresholds of the businesses that you have and how you want to respond to it. Yeah, as I said, they're not mine, they're my clients, but yeah. they're telling me these things, right? Because yeah. it's their experience. And, uh, I mean, it's it's a reality. As you say, whether you call it a bribe, or as you say, consulting fee, facilitation, there's all, it's all, it's it's all envelope work around or whatever, but yeah. Yeah. Um, it's just, it's it's a reality, as you say, if to do business there, they have to make that decision. Yeah, that's what they're going to do. It's a big world out there, and uh, there are no easy, easy answers. You've got to...